today's masterclass, we will discuss the treatment of a 60-year-old female patient with a severely resorbed mandible, wanting fixed removable implant-supported solutions. Before we begin this masterclass, I'd like to please emphasize that the masterclass is geared specifically towards intermediate and advanced level implant dentists who are struggling to treat edentulous patients with severely resorbed mandibles. As we know, there are no two cases that are the same and there are many options of how to treat patients. Like all my lectures, we speak in plain language. We show hundreds of detailed photographs with the objective of increasing understanding. But because this is a masterclass, the information herein is very technical, very graphic, step by step, and not for patients, nor for junior dentists or dental students, and also not for the faint-hearted. I have another video that I will provide the link to in the description below, which is much shorter and is geared towards informed patients, dental students, and junior dentists on the same topic. The patient reported that she was 60 years of age and had all her teeth extracted circa 30 years ago due to caries. She also reported having five sets of full upper and lower dentures manufactured over the past 30 years and her current set of dentures for the past five years. The fitting surface of the lower denture had a soft reline material in situ and had been fully manufactured by a dental technician and no dentist was involved in the manufacturing process or prescription. The patient also communicated that she was only able to eat soft food because her lower denture pressed on her mental nerves and she pointed to that with her finger and reported that it was uncomfortable and made her remove and spit out her dentures. There were no medical risk factors. The patient suffered from anxiety and was under the care of a psychiatrist and was taking medication to manage her anxiety. I telephoned to the patient's psychiatrist and she reported that the patient had undergone an ENT procedure six months earlier to correct a deviated nasal septum. This work had been performed under IV sedation and the outcome was successful and uneventful. The psychiatrist supported the planned implant rehabilitation and she identified that the patient's ongoing mouth issues played a large role in her mental health state. The medication that the patient was taking was reviewed and it was agreed that the proposed surgical work on the patient should be done under IV sedation. And the patient was mentally and physically healthy to undergo surgical implant treatment. The patient was taking the following medications. Thyroxine 150 milligrams, Pregabalin 75 milligrams, ibuprofen non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs as required, sodium valproate 500 milligrams, ketiapine 300 milligrams, TDS, cyclohexanol 50 milligrams BD as required, paracetamol 500 BD as required, and finally clonazepam 0.5 milligrams BD. So obviously there was polypharmacy at play in this particular case. The patient reported that she was wearing a full upper and lower denture but was unable to chew with her lower denture because as soon as she began chewing the denture pressed on the mental nerves causing severe discomfort and pain leading her to spit her denture out. She could only eat very soft food and the patient desired an implant supported lower denture to be able to eat her food. The patient was wearing a full set of upper and lower dentures. The upper denture had been recently made and had good suction. The lower denture was very loose and had a soft reline material on the fitting surface of this denture. There was severe resorption of the mandible with the mental nerves on the crest of the alveolar ridge being painful literally to digital pressure palpation. On the lower denture, the distance between the alveolar crest and the incisal edge was recorded as 17 millimeters, and the patient appeared to have good oral hygiene. The patient was overclosed, and the vertical height, the vertical dimension of occlusion, needed to be opened. The original vertical dimension of occlusion was recorded as 62 millimeters. The patient expressed her desire for a lower implant supported denture to be able to eat her food. She could not wear her lower denture because it pressed on her mental nerves and caused pain. The general diagnosis was removable treatment in the edentulous lower jaw. There was good quality 
and density of bone with moderate to severe atrophy of the edentulous maxillary sites. No focal osseous abnormality was appreciated. Proximity to the maxillary antral bases was noted. Only minor mucosal thickening was noted in the right antrum. The appearance of the incisive canal and the foramen was within normal limits. There was good bone quality and density with moderate to severe atrophy at the edentulous mandibular sites. No focal osseous abnormality was appreciated. The mandibular canals were on the crest of the ridge. The mental foramina and the anterior loops leading to the mental foramina were also on the crest of the ridge. The appearance of the lingual canal and the foramen was within normal limits. The bony appearances of the condylar heads were essentially within normal limits. The CBCT of the patient's jaws was taken and the crestal position of the mental nerve was identified. On the original CBCT, three possible sites for implant placement were identified. In the anterior mandible, the following sites were identified at slice plus 14, slice plus 4 and slice minus 12. As a corollary thereof, the pre-surgical planning was conducted using the patient's lower full denture, a simple and highly effective technique taught to me by Professor George Nentwick was used, where eight composite filling markings were made on the fitting surface of the denture and cross-checked on a conventional OPG. These same eight markings were then replicated on a plaster model poured into the fitting surface of the patient's lower denture, resulting in a surgical guide that replicated the exact position of these same eight markings. Additional pre-surgical planning was performed due to the patient's severely atrophied mandible crestal positioned mental nerves and the delicate and vulnerable psychiatric condition. And because I care deeply for my patient's well-being and I want to sleep peacefully at night, because this was a high risk case and I had a very limited amount of bone, plus the patient was a very vulnerable patient and an absolutely delightful person, I had to be extra careful in the planning and execution of this case. Therefore, the patient was sent for a second CBCT with the surgical guide described previously. After a second technical evaluation of the patient's x-rays, I decided to place three osteotomy sites at slice plus 10, slice plus two, and slice minus 10. And I will show all of these radiographs to you shortly. Because there were concerns about the location of the mental nerves, specifically the anterior loops in relation to the severely resorbed mandible, surgically identifying the mental nerves as they departed the mental foramina was an option. And I will show you a technique taught to me by Dr. Pablo Hess on how to do this in Masterclass 38, which is entitled, How do you assess and manage the risk of nerve damage during implant placement? However, in this particular case, we could potentially expose the patient to the risk of neuropraxia, paresthesia or anesthesia, which would be devastating for the psychologically vulnerable patient like this. The position of the sublingual artery at slice plus two was identified and we will show you the CBT shortly. The patient had limited financial means and could not afford any implants in the maxilla and her priority was the mandible. The plan was to place three implants into the mandible in the selected sites where there was sufficient bone for primary implant placement. After a healing period of three months, stability of these implants would be ascertained and if optimal, they would be fitted and interconnected with an implant bar supporting equators. The patient would be fitted with a new full upper acrylic denture and a new full lower acrylic implant supported over denture that would connect to the lower implants via equators on a bar. The 4-3 site, which was identified at slice minus 10, which is the equivalent to the US 27, there appeared to be good quality and density of bone at the site. The ridge width was 11.11 .11 millimeters and the ridge height was 10.99 millimeters. The plan was to place an Ostom US 4 external hex 
4.5 millimeter by 8.5 millimeter implant in the site. The 3-1 site, equivalent to the US-24, was identified at slice plus two. There appeared to be good quality and density of bone in this site. The ridge was 15.69 millimeters and the ridge height was 13.46 millimeters at this point. The plan was to place an Ostom US4 external hex 4 by 8.5 millimeter implant in this site. The 3-2 site at slice plus 10 of the CBCT equivalent to the US23, there appeared to be good quality and density of bone in the site. The ridge width was 10.54 millimeters and the ridge height was 12.62 millimeters. The plan was to place an Ostom US4 external hex 4 by 7 millimeter implant in the site. During the three month healing period, the patient would wear her upper and lower dentures and be regularly reviewed. Various treatment options were discussed at length with this patient, including firstly, using her upper existing full acrylic denture, obviously relined due to the financial constraints. Two, implant supported denture on a bar attached to improve retention and accommodate the location of the mental foramina. Three, implant supported denture directly onto equators which was not recommended due to the patient's mental nerves running on the crest of her alveolar ridge. Four, a good reline of her lower denture which had been previously tried but unsuccessful. Five, placing four implants into the anterior mandible which was not feasible due to the financial constraints of the patient. Six, performing the work under local anesthesia, but both the patient and her psychiatrist agreed that the intravenous sedation for the psychological management of her would be ideal. Synopsis of the definitive treatment plan. Firstly, reline of the upper and lower dentures as a provisional measure to secure her denture stability during the transitional period. Then, surgical placement of three implants in the anterior mandible where there was enough bone for primary implant placement. After the required healing period, exposure and testing of the implants followed by attachment of a bar with equators secured onto these three implants and the construction of a fresh lower implant supported overdenture. Small equally placed holes were made on the fitting surface of the patient's lower denture and then filled with composite filling prior to taking an OPG. This treatment planning was taught to me by Professor George Nantwick. The final version of the surgical guide with the distal borders of the incision lines drawn in black and the implant sites marked in red ink. Ridge mapping of the 3-2 site at slice plus 6. At slice plus 10, the 3-3 three, three implant site, ridge mapping. At slice plus 14, the ridge mapping of the 3-3 three, three site, as discussed. The left side of the mental foramen, and you can see it's approximately to the crest of the ridge. The right side of the mental foramen, and the same thing on the crest of the ridge. Ridge mapping at slice minus 4, as discussed, the 4-3 site implant ridge mapping as discussed at slice minus 10. And finally, at slice minus 14, the ridge mapping as discussed. The secondary CBCT overview with the surgical guide in C2 as discussed. The lateral CEF view with the surgical guide in C2. The CBCT OPG overview with the surgical guide in C2. An OPG with the surgical guide in C2 at the initial appointment. The patient's charting with the three implants in position. This surgical guide, this was used in the patient's mouth when taking the OPG overview and in the secondary CBCT images as previously shown. Plaster model of the surgical glide planning. An OPG with composite filling markers. These little balls were placed on the fitting surface of her lower full acrylic denture used for the implant planning. The patient's left side intraoral view. Cast model of the lower jaw with implant planning sites replicated from the patient's lower denture. Cast model of the patient's upper jaw. A cast model of the patient's upper denture. Here is a cast model of the patient's lower denture. The left side view with the patient's dentures in position. The right side view 
of the patient's dentures in position, the frontal view of the patient's dentures in C2, the intraoral view with the patient's dentures, this is of the lower denture in position, and the upper intraoral view with the dentures. The patient's laugh line, the right side intraoral view, the front extraoral view, the occlusal view of the lower jaw, and one can see a, basically just a flat ridge occlusal view of the upper jaw, an overview of the primary CBCT and the various images of the primary CBCT, primary CBCT of the lower jaw, the rest of the overview of the lower jaw, the ridge mapping of the 4-1 site, the original planning prior to CBCTE images with the surgical guide, the ridge mapping of the 3-3 site, this was the original planning prior to CBCTE images with the surgical guide. Ridge mapping of the 3-3 site, original planning prior to CBCT images with the surgical guide. And the 4-3 ridge mapping site, this was also the original planning prior to CBCT images with the surgical guide. An overview of the patient's maxilla in the primary CBCT, a CBCT overview of the mandible, the primary OPG. Surgical protocol. The patient was issued the following implant prophylaxis prescription. Amoxicillin, 500 milligram caps. TDS, 15 caps. Chlorhexidine digluconate, 0.2% mouthwash, 100 mils. And the patient was to rinse with 10 mils twice a day and instructed not to swallow. The patient was asked to take probiotics with her antibiotics and arrangements were also made for the patient to consult with a specialist anesthesiologist on this treatment. The following vital statistics baseline were taken of the patient on the day of the procedure preoperatively. The systolic was 124, the diastolic 60, the pulse rate 85 and the oxygen saturation 98. The patient was administered an intravenous sedation using midazolam and propofol by a specialist anesthesiologist. Intraorally, the patient was anesthetized with lidocaine 2% with adrenaline 1 in 80,000 in a 2.2 milliliter cartridge and we administered three cartridges plus bupivacaine 0.5% 15 milliliters. Local anesthetic was infiltrated buccally and lingually plus block anesthesia of the mental nerves bilaterally. The pre-made and planned surgical guide was constructed and double checked as discussed in part one herein and used to position the implant osteotomy sites. I will share with you the photographs of the procedure that were taken before, during and after this procedure. An upper and lower wax bite block was used to begin preparing the final implant supported prosthesis. During the initial appointment, the patient's original vertical dimension of occlusion was recorded as 62 millimeters and the intra arch distance 26 millimeters. And the plan was to open the patient's bite with the final implant supported prosthesis as the patient was overclosed. I did a try-in of the upper and lower wax dentures, but I was dissatisfied with the work as the patient was still overclosed. And I gave instruction to my dental technician to open the patient's bite by a further three millimeters, and we made arrangements for a retry. The surgical guide was carefully positioned in situ, and whilst holding it in position, the distal margins and borders of the incision lines and the proposed osteotomy sites were marked firstly with a surgical pen and then by punching through the gingiva with a two millimeter diameter surgical burr. A single long full thickness incision was made along the crest of the ridge of the anterior mandible with a single buccal relieving incision in the anterior midline. This was a T-shaped incision. Utilizing the pre-made surgical guide, implants were placed into the respective sites. In the 3-2 site, which is the equivalent of the US-23 site, received an ostom US-4 SA 4 by 7 millimeter implant and torqued out at 50 Newton centimeters. The 3-1 site, equivalent to the US-24, received an ostom US-4 SA implant 4 by 8.5 millimeters and this was also torqued at 50 Newton centimeters. And finally, the 4-3 site, equivalent to the US-27, received an ostom US-4 SA 4.5 
by 8.5 millimeter and this torqued out at 40 Newton centimeters. As a side note, I often get asked which is the best implant system and the truth is that each implant system has its own set of advantages disadvantages and unique considerations. The decision on which implant system to use for a specific case is influenced by a range of factors. As an independent implant coach, I am not aligned nor do I have a bias towards any particular implant system. This allows us to provide objective patient-centered care. I work closely with clinicians to tailor the treatment plan to each patient's individual needs, selecting the implant system that best aligns with both the patient's requirements and the clinician's expertise. Moreover, the field of dental implants is continuously advancing with new technologies and techniques emerging regularly. Consequently, as an independent coach, I stay current with the latest developments across the various implant systems and incorporating this knowledge into my coaching practices. We conduct thorough independent reviews of the numerous implant platforms worldwide with over 900 implant systems currently available. If there's a specific system that you would like us to review, please feel free to email us or leave a comment below and we'll promptly address that request. Returning to our patient, we took silicone impressions of the implants during the surgery utilizing a pre-made special tray of the implants in situ. The corresponding cover screws were then fitted onto the respective implants and finally both flaps of the lower left quadrant and the lower right quadrant were sutured closed using 5-0 polyzorb resorbable sutures. I fitted the patient's existing lower full acrylic denture with soft reline material on the fitting surface. Post-operative instructions were given to the patient and hemostasis was observed. After completion of the operation, a post-op OPG radiograph was taken and the patient was then discharged and asked to return one week later for a post-op check. On the day after the procedure, I personally telephoned the patient and she reported that her mouth was feeling good and that there was no problem. I reminded the patient to return to us for her post-op control appointments. There were no complications. The post-op OPG with the three implants in position. This is a photograph of the wound closure with the 5-0 polyzorb in position. Photograph of the three cover screws over the implant sites photograph of the lower special tray that was used to take impressions at the time of surgery, lower special tray, the impressions taken at implant level, intraoperative impressions were taken of the implants in the 3-1, 3-2 and 4-3 sites and surrounding soft tissues. Direction indicators were placed in C2, photograph of the inserted implants in the 4-3, 3-1 and 3-2 sites. Here is another view of the three implants in position, design of the flap which was T-shaped, so the initial incision line placed over here with the relieving incision and also the position of the two mental nerves was identified. So you can see the proximity to the incision lines. Here again is the primary incision before the flaps were raised and we have marked where the mental nerves are on either side. Pilot holes an incision border marked with the pilot drill on the patient's lower jaw. Surgical guide in C2, black markings indicate the maximum distal extension of the incision line and the red marks the position of the osteotomy sites. This is a photograph of the wax trine of the lower denture, pre-op trine of the wax dentures. As a clinician, I am very conscious and mindful of having the privilege of working with live tissue on patients and all experienced clinicians will understand the meaning of these words. Following on from the implant placement in the 3, 2, 3, 1 and 4, 3 sites, as we previously discussed, the patient returned for her second stage procedures eight weeks after the surgery. On inspection, the oral tissues in the mandible appeared to be healthy and pink. The patient was anesthetized with five cartridges of lidocaine 2% with adrenaline 1 in 80,000 in 2.2 millimeter cartridges and local anesthetic was infiltrated both buccally and lingually. The implants in the 3, 2, 3, 1 and 4, 3 sites 
this is the US 23, 24 and 27 sites, were individually exposed by locating them so gingerly with the original surgical guide plus a periodontal probe feeling for the cover screws. And if you just carefully probe, you'll actually feel where the cover screw, screw head is and you can mark those sites. Those sites can be identified subgingivally and then exposed with a single full thickness incision from the 3 2 for the 4 3 site. However, ensuring that there is adequate remaining attachment mucosa equally divided on both the lingual and on the buccal direction in order to ensure sufficient attached mucosa, buccal and lingual, for the healing caps and eventually for the fixed implant supported abutment bar. Bone had grown over 3-1 and 3-3 implants and I had to use a bone mill to remove this excess bone. I performed an Ostel ISQ check on the implants and recorded the readings of the ISQ as follows. In the 3-3 site the A reading was 85, the X reading 83 and I placed a 5mm healing cap. In the 4-3 site I had a reading of a reading of 87, the X reading of 94, and I placed a 5mm healing cap. And finally, in the 3 1 site, I had an A reading of 83, an X reading of 84, and I placed a 6mm healing cap in position. These are very high readings and indicate lateral stability of the implants and thereby indirectly the degree of osseointegration. And therefore, I continued with permanent rehabilitation of the mandible. The appropriate impression copings were fitted to the above mentioned implants. The three impression copings were splint together with a pre-made Duralay resin jig and an OPG was taken to check the bone around the implants and the correct fitting of the connections and then a secondary silicone impression was taken of the mandible with a pre-made surgical tray. I measured the vertical dimension of occlusion, the VDO, as 65 millimeters with the patient's existing upper and lower dentures and I recorded the patient's bite registration with a pre-made wax bite block. Secondary silicone impression was also taken of the upper jaw utilizing a pre-made special tray. Finally, healing caps were placed on the implants that were flush with the gingival level to allow the patient to use her existing lower acrylic denture. Three weeks later, we performed a try-in. The healing caps on the three implants were removed and I fitted the implant-supported lower bar and screwed down the implant-supported bar with the appropriate prosthetic screws onto the implants and I fitted the wax try-in upper and lower denture in the patient's mouth and took an OPG to check correct technical connection of the equator components and all appeared to be in order. Intraorally, there was an occlusal discrepancy between the upper and lower denture trine in centric occlusion. The lower prosthetic teeth were set in a position that resulted in a small centerline discrepancy. I recorded the occlusion with a bite registration material and asked the laboratory to adjust this discrepancy. And I confirmed the vertical dimension of occlusion was 65 millimeters. The patient was satisfied with the color and shape of her prosthetic teeth. Finally, on this visit, the implant supported bar was removed and the appropriate healing caps replaced in situ for the patient to continue to be able to use her full upper and lower acrylic dentures. A week later, we did a retry appointment. I fitted the patient's upper and lower denture wax trying in her mouth. Intraorally, there was no occlusal discrepancy between the upper and the lower trine denture and the patient's bite in centric occlusion was perfect and I confirmed the vertical dimension of occlusion at 65 millimeters. The patient once again reported that she was satisfied with the color and shape of her prosthetic teeth. A week after this, we performed the final fit appointment. I assessed the working model supplied by the laboratory, which was poured from the original silicone secondary impressions with implant impression copings. I checked the anatomic form of the prosthetic teeth in relation to the opposing prosthetic teeth and arch. An adequate proximal contact plus general smoothness and quality of the prosthetic teeth and the acrylic. 
I also checked the fitting surface of the implant supported lower denture and the female equator abutments on the fitting surface of the lower denture and the lower implant supported bar framework and there were no evidences of pitting, voids or discrepancies. I also checked the acrylic around the female equator implant abutments for optimal thickness and strength as well as marginal finish of the acrylic so that it provided optimal contour. The implant supported denture was fitted with yellow colored rigid retentive caps manufactured by Ryan 83 in Italy. Intraorally, I placed the patient in a semi-supine position for safety and I carefully removed the healing caps on the three implants and inspected the peri-implant soft tissues which appeared clinically healthy. I placed the implant supported assembly onto the individual implants and with three individual hexed titanium prosthetic screws torque them down to 35 newton centimeters which is the recommended torque for the implant restorative system and we have discussed this in the master class with regards to implant screws and then I snugly fitted the full lower acrylic implant supported denture in the patient's mouth. The three bar assembly abutments fitted smoothly in the mouth and there was no visible opening, overhang or discrepancy. With the sharp end of a dental explorer, I felt around each of the three abutment margins, periphery, to ensure that there was relatively smooth transition from the implant shoulders to the abutments with no visible openings, overhang or any other discrepancy. The bar assembly abutments fitted smoothly in the mouth and there was no visible opening, overhang or discrepancy. I then removed and replaced the implant supported denture several times to check smoothness of fit. The fit of the lower denture on the bar was secure and I showed the patient that we had designed two dedicated lower dental removal access service holes or openings between the prosthetic teeth in the 3-3 and 3-4 sites. This corresponds to US 21 and 22 on the left side and on the right hand side between the 4-4 and the 4-5 which is US 28 and 29 plus the dedicated removal tool lever specifically because the patient suffered from psychological anxiety problems and I wanted to ensure that she never encountered problems with the removal of her lower denture to action oral hygiene maintenance or removal. The patient practiced using her removal tool several times and confirmed that she could easily action on this. I carefully checked the female equator abutment margins on the denture with the sharp end of a dental explorer. I felt around each abutment for any opening, overhang or any other discrepancy and then assessed the color, the shape and the overall look of the implant supported dentures. Next, I performed an occlusal assessment. The patient was asked to close her teeth down onto the implant supported denture and initially shim stock and then later a piece of double sided blue articulating paper was placed in between her full upper and lower dentures and the new implant supported full lower denture and there was no visible signs of any significant occlusal discrepancy using a mouth mirror and double sided blue articulating paper I confirmed perfect occlusal contact in the areas of normal centric stops. I confirmed that the vertical dimension of occlusion was 65 millimeters as per our planning and finally I took an OPG radiograph control of the entire implant supported denture assembly to check that there were no discrepancies with the prosthetic teeth, superstructures, abutment, prosthetic implant screws, male implant equator abutments and female equator denture metal abutment caps and the prosthetic retentive caps and visually confirmed that everything appeared to be in order. I rechecked and confirmed the appropriate torque a second time on the prosthetic screws connecting the bar assembly onto the implants using a torque wrench and I rechecked the marginal adaptation of the female equator caps 
on the inside of the denture with an explorer and all the walls that were in order. I closed and sealed the prosthetic screws, access holes with Teflon tape and gutta perka. I'd like to just emphasize once again that we have discussed in our masterclass on abutment screws how important it is to re-tighten a second time. And we've discussed this in detail, so I won't repeat that. Prior to dismissing the patient, I used shim stock again to check the occlusion was satisfactory and utilizing articulating paper, I checked the occlusion during lateral movements and protrusion carefully for the presence of working side or non-working side interferences. There were some very minor discrepancies which are polished away using a polishing kit by Brasler. I will provide the link to all of these technical tools in the description below. I reminded the patient of the need for and care of her implant supported denture over the long term, including not using floss around her bar supported implant abutments, but rather an interdental brush or a water pick instead. We made a recall control appointment for the patient to return after one week and then again after three months to check the implant abutments for signs of any plaque buildup. The patient returned after a week and reported that her upper and lower dentures were in order and she was delighted with her result and was now able to eat foods that she previously was unable to. I consistently recommend to clinicians to educate their patients who have worn ill-fitting dentures for an extended period of time to encourage them to return to a diverse diet, just as they had done prior to losing their teeth. This step is of paramount importance to ensure their long-term general health. Post-op radiograph control with the implant-supported bar and lower denture in the patient's mouth. The extraoral smile line, the extraoral front view. Prosthetic step, the video was confirmed at 65 millimeters. Clusal view of the denture in the patient's mouth, lower denture. The same view showing hypertrophy of the patient's tongue. It is important just for a second to talk about this. This tongue is hypertrophied because the patient had such poor fitting dentures. This becomes an overactive muscle. And what happens in time, once the patient has an implant supported denture, this tongue actually reduces in size and we need to be mindful of this. So in the beginning, the patient may have some problems with that, but in time, this will regress and she'll be able to function as per normal. Denture in the patient's mouth, the left side view showing the dedicated lower denture access hole opening, which can be seen between the prosthetics teeth 3-3 and 3-4. Denture in the patient's mouth, the right side view showing the dedicated lower denture access hole opening that can be seen between the prosthetic teeth 4-4 and 4-5. Denture in the patient's mouth, right side view showing the dedicated lower denture removal access hole opening which has been placed between the prosthetic teeth 4-4 and 4-5. Dentures in the patient's mouth, the frontal view. Close-up view of the final fit of the implant supported bar occlusal oblique view. Another photograph of the final fit of the implant supported bar occlusal oblique view. Photograph of the implant supported denture fitting surface with the yellow retentive caps and we have placed four onto the bar and onto the denture. The final radiographic control of the implant supported bar in the patient's mouth, the lower implant supported bar, a close-up occlusal view, and we can see that provision has been made for one, two, three, four male equator attachments, and the one, two, three prosthetic screws, and the bar has been specifically designed in this area here and over here to overhang the underlying mental nerves. So that actually is impossible for the patient to get any pressure onto her mental nerves when she fits the denture. Left side view of the upper and lower implant supported denture showing the dedicated lower denture removal access hole opening which can be seen between the prosthetic teeth number 3-3 three, three and 3-4. Three, the lower denture on the model right side view showing the use of the dedicated denture removal tool or lever. This fits into this position and then the patient presses down 
and as she levers this down, the denture pops off on this side. She has to repeat that same process on the other side. Lower denture on the model. This is the left side view, showing the use of the dedicated denture removal tool or lever. Same thing, it's positioned into the hole. The patient then pushes down towards her feet and this pops the denture up. Left side oblique view of the lower implant supported denture showing the dedicated lower denture removal access hole openings which can be seen between the prosthetic T33 and 34 plus two dedicated removal tool levers and I always provide the patient with at least two because they tend to lose them and so at least there's uh, an emergency spare one at home. Right side view of the upper and lower implant supported denture showing the dedicated lower denture removal access hole opening which can be seen between the prosthetic teeth 44 and 45. The upper and lower denture on the model frontal view, lower denture on the model occlusal view, the upper denture on the model occlusal view. Prosthetic step of inspecting the upper denture fitting surface, a close-up view of this to make sure that there aren't any discrepancies, any sharp edges, any overhangs. Prosthetic step of inspecting of the upper denture, the fitting surface. Prosthetic step of inspecting of the lower denture fitting surface, a close-up occlusal view. The female plastic retentive caps have not yet been fitted. Prosthetic step, the fit appointment, trying of the implant bar on the working lab model at the fit appointment the lab plaster model of the upper prosthetic step at the trying bite registration was taken to modify the left lower central line discrepancy at the primary trying this is the left side view primary trying bite registration to modify the lower center line discrepancy as can be seen at the primary trying this is the frontal view prosthetic step the primary trying bite registration to modify the lower center line discrepancy at the primary trying this is the right side view prosthetic step the primary trying the extra oral view of the primary trying in position prosthetic step primary trying of the bite registration to modify the lower center line discrepancy which we can see over here frontal view secondary trying radiographic control of the implant supported bar secondary trying of the implant supported bar the occlusal view secondary trying of the implant supported bar occlusal oblique view the picture of the lower lab model picture of the upper lab model prosthetic step secondary trying of the upper and lower wax on the models this is the right side view prosthetic step secondary trying of the upper and lower wax trying on the model left side view prosthetic step secondary trying of the upper and lower trying on the model frontal view prosthetic step secondary trying of the upper wax model occlusal view prosthetic step secondary trying of the lower wax model occlusal view prosthetic step secondary trying of the implant supported bar on the model and at this point we specifically check because we had marked underneath here where the mental nerves came out so we were able to check that the bar actually covered these areas and finally prosthetic step exposure step the radiographic control of the impression copings in situ in the patient's mouth these were joined by a Duralay index the patient reported that she was delighted with her implant supported denture and had begun to eat wider range of foods the oral soft tissues looked healthy and pink and the oral hygiene was optimal and the patient reported that her implant supported bar and denture were easily cleaned and she could remove them and replace them without any difficulty the patient also confirmed that she was cleaning her implant supported bar with a toothbrush plus interdental brushes as we had shown her and with that she left for an international holiday picture of a lower denture in the patient's mouth occlusal view a picture of the upper and lower denture in the patient's mouth right side view picture of the upper and lower denture in the patient's mouth this is the left side view picture of the upper and lower denture in the patient's mouth frontal view picture of the patient's upper jaw occlusal view and we can see healthy pink soft tissues picture of the implant supported bar in the patient's mouth occlusal view and once again pink healthy tissues and by comparison this is the occlusal view of what the patient arrived at our surgery originally with. If you find our content valuable, 
We encourage you to like and subscribe to help us expand this educational platform. Remember that the path to good health lies in evidence-based scientific research. Stay tuned to our next masterclass where we will dive into the topic, are dental implants safe and provide you with valuable insights.